Welcome to the Expositors of Second Baptist Church of Houston, North Campus. The class hosts the teaching ministry of James Brooks. Our mission is to grow in the knowledge of Christ through the expositional teaching of God's Word. We do this by studying the Bible line upon line and verse by verse. We teach sound doctrine as we look at and live out God's unfolding plan of redemption for His church. Now let's join James in this week's study of God's Holy Word. So uh, tonight, if you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with me over to the book of Mark, we are still in the gospel era. Uh, and now in reference to the gospel of Mark, it was written by John Mark, who was the companion of Peter and the nephew of Barnabas. You'll recall Barnabas was the one who extended Paul the right hand of fellowship over in the book of Acts. Mark was written in approximately 55 to 60 AD, uh, predominantly to a Roman Christian audience. And the theme of Mark is that it presents Jesus as the servant of the Lord, as the servant of the Lord. As such, it is an apologetic or a defense to the Christian faith. It can be basically divided into three sections. The first section is the servant's service. We see that in chapters 1 through 8. Uh, in chapters 8 through 15, the servant's sacrifice, and then in chapter 16, the servant's sovereignty, the servant's sovereignty. So if you needed a quick way to dissect the book by way of outline, uh, this would certainly serve you well. Now I asked you last week to do a homework assignment, and that's to look up the doctrine of concurrence, which is associated with the doctrine of providence. The reason I ask you to do that is because tonight, even though we will be covering a segment of Mark chapter 11, concurrence is the backdrop on which these events transpire. Uh, the doctrine of concurrence fundamentally means this. It is the actions of two or more parties working simultaneously to produce a single result. So the actions of two or more parties which come together to produce a single result. Now in reference to this doctrine in a formal sense, R.C. Sproul uh, says it this way, concurrence refers to the actions of two or more parties taking place at the same time. One string of actions occurs with another string and they happen to merge or converge in history. So the Christian doctrine of the relationship between God's sovereignty and human volitional actions is called the doctrine of concurrence. Now we've talked about that in other classes. It is a facet, like I said, of the providence of God. And when we speak of God's providence, what we're talking about, and again to quote Sproul, is to say that the central point of the doctrine of providence simply means that God <laughs> governs everything that comes to pass, uh, pass from the least to the greatest. There's no maverick molecule running anywhere loose in the universe that is outside of the control of God. Moreover, the doctrine of concurrence is a doctrine that is demonstrated in several places in Scripture. For example, and we have used this verse, I think, last week in our lesson, uh, but Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, in reference to pr his uh, preaching to the Jews, said, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men. So here we see an example of concurrence. In other words, it was God's plan from the, for the foundation of the world that Christ come to this world and be crucified upon a cross for the sins of the many. And yet, in carrying out this plan, man chose to reject Jesus as the Messiah and the Christ, and the Jews handed him over to the Romans who hung him on a cross for execution. So we see, on the one hand, man making responses, decisions, and actions that would ultimately lead to the crucifixion of Christ, and yet this being God's plan in his overarching plan of redemption. Another place where we see the doctrine of concurrence demonstrated is when Joseph's brothers, you'll recall, sold him into slavery. 
Based upon a couple of dreams that Joseph had, he tells his family, his brothers became jealous of him. They eventually sold him uh, to some traders that were happened to be passing by who took Joseph down to Egypt. And through several acts of uh, God's providence, Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt. In the story, you'll recall that eventually Joseph's brothers, because of a great famine in the land, have to come down to Egypt where they are confronted by Joseph. And then Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. His brothers become terrified because they think within themselves, man, now Joseph is the prime minister of Egypt. He could have all of us executed as payback. And Joseph says this to them. He says, do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve your life. For the famine has been in the land two years, and there is still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. But God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here. Well, wait a minute. It was them that sent him there. Remember, they pulled him up out of that well and gave him to the passerbys and sold him off into slavery. It was them. But what Joseph is doing here, he's looking at the, the, uh, the situation through theological lenses. And what he's describing to his brothers is the doctrine of concurrence. In other words, you sent me here, and yeah, for that you are morally responsible, but understand this, that it was ultimately God's plan to have me here. So in that sense, God sent me here, but he did so through your responses, decisions, and actions. And then Joseph says, as for you, you meant evil against me. In other words, what you did was an evil act, but God meant it for good. And what good? in order to bring about this result, in, or, in order, that is, to preserve a nation, a people group that would become God's chosen people. So, with that understanding of concurrence, we need to understand, uh, in reference to what we will be discussing tonight, which is the triumphal entry of Jesus, uh, MacArthur notes that this scene, that is the triumphal entry, sets in motion a plan that will see Jesus arrested and executed. The exposure of interest in Jesus must reach to threaten his enemies to cause them to escalate their efforts to have him dead. That is, to move really fast and make it happen the way that it, God has determined that it would happen. Uh, and the, So that's everything that we're talking about here is uh, dealing with this triumphal entry. So we call it the triumphal entry, but it's actually a false coronation of a true king because it's not really a triumphal entry. If you understand a Roman triumph, what would happen is that the king, the leader, would come back in the city from which he lives riding on a white horse and he would have all of his armies following him, carrying the banners of all of the campaigns with which they were victors. And then behind them, he would be following in this great parade or this triumph would be all of the spoils of the enemies, all of their gold, all of their resources. If they had some form of entertainment, all of that stuff would come back with them. And then finally behind them would be the slaves, that is the captives. Uh, and so this is nothing like a triumph, but it is called the triumphal entry. There are several reasons for that, of which we will see as we cover these verses. So in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 11, we'll look at the king's preparation, and then in verses 7 through 10, the king's presentation, verse 11, the king's purpose, and then finally we will pull some principles uh, from this passage that would be applicable for us to apply in our life today. So let's consider the king's preparation. This is the final week of Jesus' public ministry. During this week he will come into the city of Jerusalem and by Friday he will be hanged or hung on a cross. But let's consider how Jesus prepares for this uh, 
week. In verses 1 through 6, we see that he tells two of the disciples to go and bring him a colt, a little donkey, to come riding into Jerusalem. <clears throat> Mark writes, as they approached Jerusalem at Bethpage, at Bethany and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will enter it. You will find a colt tied there, on which no one has yet ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? You say, The Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it back here. They went away and found a colt tied at the door outside in the street, and they untied it. Some of the bystanders were saying to them, what are you doing untying that colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them their permission. So what we see then here is a, really a phenomenal demonstration of Jesus' omniscience. In other words, he's telling these, these disciples, uh, describing this event exactly where you'll find this, this resource or this tool or this animal that I need, <laughs> Uh, to come riding into Jerusalem and so go get it. And if anyone says anything to you, just say, the Lord has need of it and they'll give it to you. So it demonstrates his omniscience. It also demonstrates, as we look at the, the places, because the places specifically are mentioned as well, Bethpage and Bethany. And this is significant. Why? Because you'll realize that on Saturday, that is the Saturday before the crucifixion, this is six days before the Passover, and John notes this over in his gospel in John chapter 12, verse 1. We don't know exactly where Bethpage is, but we have a general idea of where it is, uh, a little bit north of the place called Bethany. So on Saturday, Jesus comes into Bethpage, and then on the next day and Sunday, Jesus will go from Bethpage to Bethany at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, uh, and after he had raised Lazarus from the dead, all of these people were wanting to come to Bethany to see the man whom had come back out from the grave. And so there was a big crowd of people that did that. Now, the events on Sunday, and there is a reason why we're covering these events and days and so forth. Uh, let's look at this uh, from over in John chapter 12, uh, the events here on Sunday, because most of the time, Christian Tradition has said that Jesus came into Jerusalem uh, on a Sunday. And I, I think that's really based more on tradition than it is based upon historical fact. There's reasons for that, which we'll look at here in just a second. But look at what happens here on Sunday. A large crowd of Jews then learned that Jesus was at Bethany, and he came not for Jesus' sake, but also that they might see Lazarus. I mean, can you imagine having been dead four days, all of a sudden, here's this guy who's up walking around. He would definitely be a novelty, would he not? I mean, CNN and Fox News would be outside his house with these big vans wanting to talk to this guy saying, you know, what was it like and what did you experience and, and those types of things. And so all of these people are coming to see Jesus and Lazarus. But the chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death also. Notice that. Why? Well, wait a minute. Here's a guy who just came back from the dead. Wouldn't you want, as a theologian, to talk to him and say, what was the experience like? And did you see a big light and all of these other things? No, they wanted to put Lazarus to death again. Why? Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing, that is, trusting in Jesus. And then John notes, on the next day, which would have been a Monday, the large crowd who had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him. And thus they have the triumphal entry. Notice, so he says, on the next day, which would have been Monday. So on Monday, this is the day that Jesus sends the disciples uh, to bring back the donkey or the colt. Uh, Earl Radmacher in his uh, commentary said this, quote, Christ's deity is evident in this passage. You will find demonstrations of his omniscience. It is possible for a donkey on which no one is sat to be very calm and accommodating, but Jesus is also the master of all nature and all creatures. Jesus sat on it without incident. Now, he must be from the country. Because those of you who have been around horses, and I understand a donkey's not a horse, but they're of the same kind of mentality uh, and purpose, 
uh, know that if you've n uh, ever tried to ride a horse that's never been ridden, uh, they are not going to act very calm. As a matter of fact, they're going to violently try to throw you off of them. But so he notes that not only is Jesus then demonstrating his, his uh, authority as God in this omniscience uh, being known and demonstrated, but also the fact that this animal who's never been ridden before is completely calm through this whole process. So let's consider his actual presentation. We know now that he's got the donkey, he's fixing to come in to Jerusalem. So the people celebrated the arrival of the king. Look at verse 7. They brought the colt to Jesus and put their coats on it, and he sat on it, and many spread their coats in the road, and others which spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields. Those who went in and those who followed him were shouting, Hosanna, uh, which means save now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. So again, here we find this crowd making a reference back to the Davidic promise. Remember 2 Samuel chapter 7, that uh, God promises David that his descendant would sit on the throne perpetually. And so the people are looking at Jesus saying, this is the son of David. So why do we say that Jesus came in here on this Monday? Well, there are four evidences for that biblically. First... Jesus coming in to Jerusalem on a Monday is a fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, prophecy concerning the Messiah. You'll recall when we uh, studied Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 and 27, Daniel is giving Jeremiah, or uh, in reference to uh, God giving Daniel a panoramic vision of all of the events concerning Israel's future. And so he writes, so you are to know and discern that from the time of issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the prince, there will be se uh, seven weeks and 62 weeks. And it will be built again with plaza and moat, even the times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off. So we showed you the chart during that time. But for those of you who were not here for that class, consider this chart up here. We know from Nehemiah chapter 2 that Artaxerxes decrees that Nehemiah go and restore and rebuild Jerusalem, the walls, right? And he says that'll take 49 years. And then after that, another 62 weeks or 434 years later, the Messiah will be cut off. So what we're looking at back then is that the decree to rebuild was given March the 5th, 444 B.C. And... That time, that is the 49 years plus the 62 or 434 years, when you total those things together, that comes out to 173,880 days, which means from the time to the decree is given by God until that 173,880 day would have been March the 30th, 33 AD. Why is that significant? Because that's the day that Jesus came riding in Jerusalem on that colt. Just to verify that, we can take 476 years, multiply that by 365 days, calendar days, that comes out to the 173,855 days, and then you figure the time between March the 5th and March the 30th, which is 25 days, which when you add that together, comes up to the 173,880 days, which is again March the 30th, 33 AD. Why is that significant? because that demonstrate to us, demonstrates to us that biblical prophecy can be trusted down to the letter of the day. Dwight Pentecost in his commentary writes, quote, Daniel's prophecy then anticipated Christ's offer of himself to the nation Israel as her Messiah and the nation's rejection of him as the Messiah and his crucifixion. That is, the Messiah would be cut off. So again, the reason we say that Jesus came into Jerusalem on a Monday is because of the prophecy that we find in Daniel. But there's also a prophecy that we find over in the prophet Zechariah concerning how the Messiah would come into Jerusalem. We find that in Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. 
He is just and endowed with salvation, humble, and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal or son of a donkey. Now, this is somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy. That is, Jesus, knowing full well what scripture is, instructs his disciples to go get this donkey. Um, however, it is uh, still a fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. Not only in reference to his coming into, uh, on a Monday is a fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy and is a fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy, but it was also a fulfillment of Christ being the Passover lamb. Now consider this. Those of you who are familiar with the Passover, right? You know that the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt. The last great miracle that Pharaoh needed before he ultimately changed his mind. Uh, God says that the angel of death is going to pass over Egypt. And anyone who does not have the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of their residence, the firstborn of the family would be taken. The angel of death would pass over. Uh, and if the angel of death saw the blood on the, of the lamb on the door, then it would pass over that house, thus the name Passover. Now in reference to that lamb, notice what Moses says. Uh, because they started to have the Passover celebration in order to commemorate that event. These are the instructions that Moses gives to the children of Israel for every subsequent generation after that generation. He says, speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, and the month he's referring to is Nisan. In this case, and on this day, it would have been Monday, what? March the 30th, 33 AD. Speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, they are to each take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb from each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of the persons in them, according to what each man should eat. You are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be unblemished, an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. So there's, there's, uh, they are to select the Passover lamb on a Monday. They are to offer that Passover lamb for their sin on a Friday. The 14th day of Nisan, which in this case turns out to be Friday, April the 3rd, 33 AD, the day that Christ died upon the cross. So what are the evidences for a Monday triumphal entry? It was a fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, a fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecy. It was a fulfillment of Christ being our Passover lamb. And then finally, and with the most final authority, Christ himself said to the Jews in reference to that day, in Luke chapter 19, when he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it saying, if you had known in this, the day, that is, this day, even you, the things which may for, make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. Okay, MacArthur notes, they, that is, the people, heard Jesus' message, they attested to his miracles, they acknowledged his divinity because he had all these miracles that he did, but they rejected Jesus as Savior and Lord. They were totally earthbound, they were materialistic and self-satisfied. They were interested only in the kingdom of this world and not in the kingdom of heaven. They would have accepted Jesus as an earthly king, but they would not have him as their heavenly king. And that fundamentally is their problem. That is why we could call this passage the false coronation of the true king. So why does Jesus do this? Why does he draw all of this attention to himself when all this time up in his ministry, you'll remember, particularly over in the Gospel of John, they realized that he had this power and so they wanted to take him by force and make him king. He withdrew from them and you know these different examples where uh, he would demonstrate the power of God and people would say hey you know this is the guy this is the Messiah and he would withdraw from people now he's not now he's now he's doing something to draw attention to himself 
Look at verse 11 and how Mark records this. Jesus goes into the temple. In verse 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem, came into the temple, and after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve. Since it was already a late day, Mark adds. Talk about an anticlimactic day. Mark doesn't even mention the crowds. You have to go to the other Gospels when they talk about the triumphal entry to really look and see how the people were responding. What an uneventful event, the way that Mark records it. But Jesus did this for a purpose. The question we might be asking ourselves as we read the text would be, what could Jesus do to provoke the religious leaders to put him to death? Because now he's working on God's timetable. It's a Monday, and Friday is just around the corner. So why did he go to the temple? He went to the temple to put a plan together, to case the joint, you might say, to look around to see what was happening there. Because Jesus will end his public ministry just as he started his public ministry, and he will do it by cleansing the temple. Look at verse 15 of Mark 11. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple, and overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a robber's den. And the chief priest and the scribes heard this, and they began seeking how they could destroy him. Why? For they were afraid of him, for the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. So Jesus ends his public ministry as he begins it by inciting the religious establishment against him. Now some of you might be saying, wait a minute, I mean, we always heard there was one cleansing event. You mean there's two? Yes, there's two. He, at the beginning of his ministry, cleansed the temple as well. This happened in 30 A.D. at the beginning of his ministry. Now it's happening again at 33 A.D. In the first incident, he drives out uh, the sellers with a whip that he makes. In this particular incident, he, there's no mention of a whip or anything. He just overturns the tables. Uh, in the first incident, first incident, he is questioned by the religious leaders. And in this particular incident, he's not questioned by the religious leaders. They're just trying to seek to kill him now. <laughs> in the first incident, Jesus does not quote, quote Isaiah 56 in the reference to what we had just uh, discussed. And then in this incident, he does. And so MacArthur notes that this was designed by God. In other words, this event where he was going to go in and cleanse the temple to inflame his enemies to ex exactly the precise time. Why? So that his enemies would be severely threatened and would execute him on and according to God's divine schedule. So here we see then the doctrine of concurrence being fulfilled in what Peter is talking about in Acts chapter 2. This is the mechanics of it that we see being worked out here in this gospel uh, presentation. On the one hand, you have Jesus who comes to the Jewish people and he offers himself as uh, the Davidic king. Uh, of course, entrance into the kingdom is based upon repentance and faith and trusting in Christ, not only as Messiah, but as Lord and God, which the people refuse to do. As such, uh, the people reject him. He will then withdraw the offer of the kingdom, uh, and then he will tell the Jewish people that there will be a future generation of Israelites who will produce the fruits of the kingdom, and that's still future for us that will occur during the time of the millennial kingdom. So on the one hand, we have Jesus making a true offer of himself as Israel's Messiah and them rejecting it. Now God is using those events to accomplish the grand purpose of taking Jesus and making sure that he is executed upon a cross. Why? Because first and foremost, God must be appeased for sin. Jesus took on the nature of a man to pay for sins. The reason that Christ, the second person of the Godhead, had to come and take on an additional nature, a human nature, is because 
he had to atone for the sins of the world. A God, a God that is, cannot die. One of the attributes of God is that he is eternal. Moreover, God is spirit. God cannot die, but a God-man can. And so he took on the nature of a human being. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He died upon the cross so that those uh, who would trust in him would receive the benefits of his uh, sa sacrificial uh, work. And whoever that is trust in him uh, will be saved. So those are the two things that are working concurrently to fulfill this plan. On the one hand, you have a real offer of salvation and a real uh, work of Jesus that is rejected and on the other hand we have God's divine plan being carried out this is a very difficult concept for people to get people will understand this because they'll say that's God's eternal plan but most often it is the case that they will not get this as the means by which this takes place everybody tracking with me in other words this is the master plan this right here are the details of how the master plan is being fulfilled. Because it takes into account man's responses, decisions, and his actions for how Christ will be presented, how he will be rejected, and he, how he will ultimately be sacrificed upon the cross. MacArthur notes, did the people know that he had the credentials of the Messiah? Yes, he demonstrated that. He was born of the line of David. He worked miracles, he healed sick people, he cast out demons, he raised dead people. How could they possibly decide to crucify him? MacArthur notes, I'll give it to you real simple. If Jesus doesn't do what the sinner wants Jesus to do, the sinner will turn on him. As he did during the time of the life of Christ, so he will today. Many times today when we look around at people, they have this false notion or they have created a Jesus of their own liking after their own image. How many times have you heard people when you discuss sin and how a person must repent and confess their sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation? Because if not, people will die in their sins and spend an eternity in hell. And when you start talking about judgment in hell and people will say, whoa, 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 that's not my Jesus. My Jesus is a God of love. That might be the case, but if you have a Jesus who does not, in that doctrine, include repentance and faith and confession and belief, then that is a false gospel and that is a false Jesus. That is not the biblical Jesus. So what are some of the things that we can take away from this? First, believe the Bible. Believe the Bible. Every scripture concerning Christ and his kingdom has been and will be fulfilled. As such, do not ever doubt the veracity of God's word. Crawford H. Toy. Anyone in here ever heard of that guy? He was a theological prodigy of the 1800s. He was actually a professor at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. When he came on to the seminary as a younger man, he was brilliant. Boyce, who was the president of the Southern Baptist the uh, Seminary, uh, John Brodus, uh, a lot of these other real prominent theologians, they were amazed at Toy's abilities. I mean, he could go sit in a Hebrew and Greek class and would know more than his professors. I mean, he was the pride of the seminary. As time went on, he began to teach at the seminary and he began to teach these liberal views that were coming over from Western Europe, the higher criticism, which began to doubt that the Bible is truly the word of God and that the creation of Adam and Eve was really an allegory to describe how man got, got up on the earth and so forth. In other words, he began to doubt the inerrancy and the truthfulness and the correctness of the Holy Scripture. 
So much so that because he was teaching what he was teaching in class, he was given an academic warning from the president of the seminary not to teach those liberal views because it would corrupt the students and eventually corrupt the churches. But he didn't listen. So he had to be dismissed on the train station as he was beginning to move north because as soon as he was let go from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, he was hired by Harvard University. And they didn't have a much high regard for scripture as they do not still today. As he was about to board the train, the president of the seminary placed his arm around Toy and raised his right hand and with tears in his eyes said, oh, oh brother Toy, how I wish you believed what you believed when you first came to us. As a matter of fact, Toy was slated to marry a young girl who was a theological powerhouse in her own right. Perhaps you've heard of her. Her name is Lottie Moon. She was a missionary who lived in China who was scheduled to marry Toy. She came back from her missionary work, was going to marry Toy, and they were going to go off and do ministry together. But after she was spent some time with him, she broke off their engagement. When asked why, she said, because I cannot love a man who doubts the word of God. And she broke off her engagement, went back to China, and died over in the Orient, a lonely woman. If people ever begin to go off that road, they end up going nowhere. He eventually became a Unitarian pastor. And eventually said that he didn't believe the Bible at all. R.C. Sproul puts it this way. As Christians, we are required to believe, to preach, and to teach what the Bible says is true, not what you want the Bible to say is true. This is the book. This is the standard. Where Scripture is silent, so shall we be. But where it speaks clearly, we must speak clearly. Because God's Word can be trusted. Count on His revelation. Secondly, Count on God's return. As prophesied and fulfilled by Jesus' triumphal entry, He will also fulfill the day of His return. Though no man knows the day or hour of that return, Jesus will return and rule over God's promised kingdom. The question for us is, are we ready to meet Him? John the Revelator records His true coronation. That was a false coronation of a true king. But the true coronation of the true king will occur when Christ return and it is recorded for us in Revelation 19.11. This is a triumph. John the Revelator writes, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. And his eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. If you're trusting in Christ tonight for the forgiveness of sins and eternal life, that's you. But notice, Christ is returning on an army where his army is wearing white robes, white linens, fine and clean. Which means what? Which means we're an army that comes to take over. But we don't have to lift a finger. So how is Christ going to defeat his enemies? Watch what happens. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations. What will Jesus do? He will come down to this earth and those who stand today or on this day with their fist in God's face saying, we will not have you as our king. He will say, drop dead. And they'll be gone just like that. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of Almighty God. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings. King of Kings 
and Lord of Lords. When he returns upon this earth, Zechariah 14 says this, On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in the middle from the east to the west by a very large valley, so that half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half will move to the south. Now Zechariah says this is what's going to happen when Jesus returns. Because he is going to return exactly how he left in the pattern with which he left. We know this because when he ascended up into heaven, angels appeared to the disciples and they said this, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up to you in heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Now today, if you were to go and stand on top of the Mount of Olives and look down into Jerusalem across the Kidron Valley, this is what you would see. You would see a graveyard. You would see graves scattered all across the side of this mountain, particularly over in the eastern gate, a Muslim graveyard. As a matter of fact, the Muslims in the 1500s were so aware of this prophecy that Christ coming across the Kidron Valley and into the eastern gate, that they actually had the eastern gate sealed up, as if that's going to stop them. <laughs> it says that a great earthquake will come and will split this mountain in half. In other words, this graveyard is not going to be there. It's Half of it's going to go to the north. The other half's going to go to the south. Christ is going to walk across that Kidron Valley. He's going to come into the eastern gate. He will set up his throne in the temple. And he will rule for 1,000 years. And those who are faithful to him will rule and reign with him. That is the glory that Christ will bring back to this earth. And God will be all in all. But, and all of that, by the way, is right here in this book. So we can believe it. We are commanded to believe it. We are commanded to teach it. As one poet notes, it is the Father's will that we believe in His one and only Son. In Him alone we put our faith and trust, and not in deeds or religion. Christ said, repent and believe in the gospel. For this truth He died on the cross. Let no one refuse it and be judged to hell and suffer infinite loss. No other way but through Jesus, not Mary nor saints now dead. Christ is the only Redeemer because that's what this book has said. Believe it.